first of all, I'd like to, to thank Professor Salzano and Professora Bortolini for organizing this conference and bringing us here. And this is uh, really good for me because I've actually been to Puerto Alegre once before, 31 years ago. <laughs> Professor Salzano was the host. And now that I'm back, I can see 31 years ago, way too long not to come back. É muito bom a voltar. Eu gosto muito do Brasil e os povos brasileiros. Outra vez, muito obrigado. So, I'm going to talk about human evolution over the last two million years. And what I'm going to try to do is integrate what we know from the genes, fossils, and archaeology. Although, because I'm a geneticist, I'm going to really focus mostly on what the genes tell us and then just overlay <coughs> the fossils and the archaeology. And in one sense, I'm kind of the outlier in this area. So uh, I'll, I'll prepare you for that right away. So I'm going to develop a model that doesn't correspond to any of the eight models that you saw illustrated earlier. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to extract historical information from genes. So genes are going to be my fossil information about the past. And so how can you get information from the past <coughs> in the genes that exist today? And you can use a, a theory of population genetics called coalescent theory. And of course, everybody knows about DNA replication, how you can start with one molecule and then you replicate and get two molecules. <coughs> but if you look at it backwards in time, and after all, we're evolutionary biologists. We're all backwards thinkers, okay? We look at the present and look in the past and then go back to the past. So we don't really care about DNA replication. We want the time inverse of DNA replication. So we say if you start with two molecules today, in the past, they coalesce to one molecule in the past. That's the essence of coalescence. And there's now an elaborate theory about looking at <coughs> DNA replication backwards in time, coalescent theory. And what it also means is that by looking at molecules today, you have information about what existed in the past. And one way of <coughs> capturing that information is through the concept of a haplotype tree. So suppose you have a sample of DNA molecules that you looked at today. And this sample has a history of coalescence. As we go back in time, what are two molecules today can coalesce into an ancestral molecule in the past. And as we go farther and farther back into the past, each coalescent event reduces the number of DNA lineages by one until finally you go back <coughs> to a single ancestral molecule. And what's very important is all homologous genes coalesce to a common ancestor. In fact, that's the very meaning of homology, descent from a common ancestor. So some people think it's really spectacular that there's a mitochondrial E. That's the most trivial observation possible. It just simply says all the mitochondrial DNA in our species coalesces to a common ancestral form. That's true for every mitochondria in every species. It's true for every homologous section of the genome. You always coalesce to a common ancestor. Now, we don't usually see this elaborate pattern of coalescence. The only thing we can see from current genetic studies, we can see differences. So I've color-coded different allelic or haplotype states here. And so I've indicated by a mutation where mutations occur associated with certain DNA replication events. And I showed that how they create different colors. So what we see is not this entire genealogical structure of the genes. What we see is only a low resolution version of it. We only see the part where the DNA replication event was also marked by mutation. So this is what we see. So it's a low resolution version of this where everything that's the same color is collapsed together. So on this tree, every one of these branches is marked by a mutational change. And that's what we can estimate. That's what we can reconstruct. So we don't see this. We can <coughs> see this. But even this can be very valuable. This haplotype tree has information about time in it. So for example, we know that haplotype A is a descendant from haplotype B from this tree. So this is younger. This one is older. 
So there's temporal information in this tree. And what we can do is we can overlay other kinds of information on top of this tree. And in particular, for this talk, we'll uh, it'll be spatial information. So these haplotypes have not only the existence in time that is captured by the haplotype tree, but they have an existence in space, which we can see in the current array of genetic variation. And what we're going to do is overlay space on top of this haplotype tree to see what kinds of inferences we can make about the past. <coughs> now, one thing that's really critical is <coughs> that a haplotype tree should never be equated to a tree of human populations or populations in general in any species. These trees are trees of the genetic variation in that particular DNA region. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't any information about the history of the population. Obviously, if there wasn't, I wouldn't be giving this talk. But that population history has to be extracted very carefully from the tree. It's not the tree itself and its topography doesn't actually indicate the history. And I think a dramatic recent ex illustration of this was this paper that came out recently by Ebersberger et al. And they looked at 23,000 regions of the human genome in apes and rhesus monkey and humans. And below is a summary of their results of the trees that significantly resolved the species tree. Okay. And here is the species tree that everybody accepts. Humans and chimps are sister species, then gorilla, orang, orangutans, then rhesus monkey. And you can see about three quarters of the, of the haplotype trees gave you that species tree. And that's great. But on the other hand, you can say a quarter of the trees, and these were the statistically significant ones, gave you a different tree. And it wasn't that those trees were wrong. Those were the true trees for that region of DNA. And so in many cases, you had some that put chimps and gorillas together. Here, humans and uh, gorillas. Uh, the other more common one was human, well, humans and gorillas and so on. So you had alternative trees embedded in our same genome. So each gene can have a different evolutionary history. And that's actually what we expect from coalescent theory. You get this result because you have polymorphic populations. And after they split, they can still have lineage sorting of the different allele lineages. And sometimes they sort in a way that's incompatible with how the population split. And this becomes very uh, common when there's a lot of polymorphism and the time interval between the events is short. And that's really critical when we go to the intraspecific level because as this showed, it's dangerous to equate a haplotype tree to a species tree. But now when you're dealing with a haplotype tree of populations within a species, the problem of lineage sorting is much greater. The time depth, the time intervals between events is much shorter. So we do not expect topological consistency among the different haplotype trees. So the information about population history is not in the topology of the tree but it's going to be in other patterns. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. <coughs>